Okay, so we're on page uh, six of your outlines uh, that we started last week. So this is a two-part series, and then I'm going to do another two-parter in the first two weeks of December. So we'll meet the first two weeks of December, and then we're going to have uh, a little break before we um, gather together again for the 2023 and dive back hard back into Genesis and science and all those things in the new year. Um, so uh, this is a two-part session from a chapter in a book called Fast Facts on False Teachings by Ed Decker and Ron Carlson. And I highly recommend that book. It's, it's especially written for lay people to be able to deal with some of the biggest believed false teachings uh, in America, including evolution, um, uh, Mormonism, Roman Catholicism, and so forth, as far as people putting their trust in something that's missing the key elements of the gospel. So um, that's what this is, that's where this is coming from, and I just think it's a really good chapter. It, it seems like you all enjoyed it last week, and especially the way he illustrated uh -huh. uh, each of the points, I think was very helpful. Um, so we're at the bottom of page six, and um, they ask the question, why do they teach evolution? So if evolution, uh, you know, the, the primary uh, reasons why people are evolutionists, the reasons that we've looked at, um, seem to be pretty weak. Um, don't really have a great defense, and yet it's, it's so widely held. Why is that? So they ask the question, why do they teach evolution? And they say, some people have asked us, and again, that's Ron Carlson and Ed Decker, if there's no evidence for evolution, why do teachers continue to propagate it in our universities and schools? Dr. Philip E. Johnson, professor of law at the University of California at Berkeley, and if you'll remember, we've talked about him already a few times, um, he's sort of considered one of the founders of the intelligent design movement. And uh, good to have somebody from our neck of the woods uh, that's pretty solid and, uh, and really get, has helped the cause of getting the whole idea of an alternative to evolution in culture. So he's written a book exposing the falsehood of evolution entitled Darwin on Trial, which I highly recommend. And he was speaking at a conference when he was asked this question. And his reply was very interesting, coming from someone within the academic community. So he said this, he said, most professors continue to teach evolution in the universities out of fear. This fear is that of not being tenured, of not getting research grants, of not being published, and of not being accepted by their peers. Um, so again, very interesting. Um, they don't teach it, he, he doesn't say they teach it because they believe it, because it's a fact, uh, because they're convinced of this, it's out of fear. And again, not being tenured, not getting research grants, not being published, and not being accepted by their peers. Uh, and again, if you look at almost anything in society and culture right now, that's why a lot of people do what they do, period. That's why they have whatever job they have, whether they're in politics or law or whatever. There's tremendous pressure to be politically correct. And those that go against that are heavily uh, punished. So um, it's unfortunate that we don't, we don't consider truth the highest value anymore. Um, it's being accepted. It's not rocking the boat. It's going with the flow. And so to be accepted, to be published, to be granted research money, and to be tenured by their university, they must follow the party line, which is evolution. And this is how the academic game is played. Welcome, Scott, by the way. When did you get in? Oh, wow. Okay, if you, fought, if you want to lay down on the couch and just <laughs> soak it in. You just came from Korea, so. Um, yeah, well, welcome back. I didn't let myself. Oh, really? Okay, good, good. You look, you look refreshed. You look like, okay, good. <laughs> good. Well, welcome. Welcome back. 
Okay, so another reason we believe why evolution continues to be taught in spite of the contrary evidence is the educational mindset that grips our schools today. Our schools have essentially, quote, ruled out the answer before they asked the question, end quote. They have said, there is no God, now let's ask the question. What is the origin of life? And the reason they never find the answer is because they ruled it out before they asked the question. It is highly unscientific and anti-intellectual to rule out answers before you ask questions. Okay, that is no different from going to a math class and having the professor tell you the first day there is no number four. Number four does not exist. Number four is simply the figment of some fundamentalist imagination. Then you go back to class the second day and the professor asks you the question, what is two plus two? You answer three or five, but it cannot be four because four doesn't exist. Okay, I, I just love the way they illustrate things. You know, very, um, it makes it very simple, but again, it's a good point. It, it's the same point, right? Okay, so I think that's really good. That's something that we can remember. The problem is that when you do this, you're no longer involved in education, but indoctrination. We have been indoctrinating an entire generation in the false belief that there is no God and that we are simply animals evolved from slimy algae. The logical end result of this tragedy is a generation of people who don't know who they are, where they came from, or where they're going. We have become a lost generation looking everywhere and trying everything to give us value, self-esteem, and meaning to life. So there's two sources uh, essentially to reality or two alternatives to the materialistic view and the, the Christian worldview. And Randy Alcorn, who by the way, I recommend everything he writes, uh, great teacher of the Bible. His book on heaven is in my top 10 books that I think every Christian should read. And um, so he's the founder of Eternal Perspective Ministries in Oregon, and he summed it all up concisely in an article entitled, The Two Sources of Self-Esteem. And I think this is really good. He said, everywhere in the secular media, I've been hearing and reading about the critical problem of poor self-esteem among our young people. A bad self-image is being cited as the cause of teen suicide, drug abuse, crime, and violence. Educators and community leaders are trying to find ways to help children bolster their self-esteem. Where does this plague of low self-esteem come from? Ironically, straight from the atheistic evolutionary view of man with which society has indoctrinated our young people. Where can they get a healthy and accurate self-esteem from the very Judeo-Christian ethic society is rejecting and trying so desperately to keep out of the classrooms and public life? Let me summarize the secular and Christian foundations for self-esteem then you tell me whether it's any wonder why America's children are feeling like they, their lives, and their values have so little meaning. So here's the secular basis for self-esteem. You are the descendant of a tiny cell of primordial protoplasm that washed up on an ocean beach three and a half billion years ago. You are the blind and arbitrary product of time, chance, and natural forces. Your closest living relatives swing from trees and eat crackers at the zoo. You are a mere grab bag of atomic particles, a conglomeration of genetic substance. You exist on a tiny planet in a minute solar system in an obscure galaxy in a remote and empty corner of a vast, cold, and meaningless universe. You are flying through lifeless space with no purpose, no direction, no control, and no destiny but final destruction. You are a purely biological entity, different only in degree but not in kind from a microbe, virus, or amoeba. You have no essence beyond your body, and at death you will cease to exist entirely. What little life you do have is confined to a fragile body aimlessly moving through a world plagued by war, famine, and disease. The only question is whether the world will manage to blow itself up before your brief and pointless life ends on its own. In short, you came from nothing, you are going nowhere, and you will end your brief cosmic journey beneath six feet of dirt. 
Where all that is, you will become food for bacteria and rot with worms. Now, why don't you feel good about yourself? <laughs> okay. And there was a survey done, and children today are fearful, I mean, a majority of climate change. Oh, yeah. That's what they've been propagandized. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're fighting for their lives, you know, really. Yeah. Okay, let's look, let's contrast that, okay, with the Christian basis for self esteem. You are a special creation of a good and all-powerful God. You are the climax of his creation, the magnum opus of the greatest artist in the universe. You are created in his image with capacities to think, feel, and worship that set you above all other life forms. You differ from the animals not simply in degree, but in kind. Not only is your kind unique, but you are unique among your kind. God has masterminded the exact combination of DNA and chromosomes that constitute your genetic code, making you as different from all others as every snowflake differs from the rest. Your Creator loved you so much and so intensely desires your companionship and affection that despite your rebellion, He gave the life of His only Son that you might spend eternity with Him. If you are willing to accept the gift of salvation, you can become a child of God, the King of the universe. As a Christian, you are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. He has given you special gifts and abilities to serve Him in a particular and unique way. Your Heavenly Father is sovereign and will allow nothing to cross your path that is not Father filtered. He cares for you so much that he is totally available to you at all times and listens to every word you say. He cares deeply about your hurts and has a perfect plan for your life. He has given you the inspired word of God as a roadmap for living. He gives you the truth that sets you free, a life that is abundant and eternal, and a spiritual family that loves and needs you. Your destiny is to live forever in a magnificent kingdom to reign with Christ over the universe. You will in forever enjoy the wonders of His presence and the marvels of His creations. You will spend eternity in intimate and joyful fellowship with your beloved Lord and your precious spiritual family. Now, how does this make you feel about yourself? Okay, what a contrast, right? That's just really good. I mean, I would encourage you to just pray over who you could just read those two to contrast to and then discuss it because I think it's it's sort of an overwhelming difference really and again as a Christian we have the advantage because we have the truth so um, and that's the thing I love about Greg Kokel's idea of in his book tactics is you don't have to know you don't have to know a lot to be able to defend your faith what you do have to do is ask good questions that help people to see that what they believe is lacking. Because again, if, it, if, if they believe anything that conflicts with the Word of God, it's lacking. Okay, it's, it's problematic. And so, we're not the ones with the problem. They are. And, but it's more important to let them defend what they believe. Because they ha you're going to have a harder time defending something when it's not true. Okay, so, so I think that's you know, one, one thing I hope you get out of every time we meet in Deeper Dive, and even at church on Sunday, you know, I, I try to do a lot to integrate apologetics with any passage of Scripture we're, we're dealing with uh, because we are uh, surrounded by people that are skeptics and that think that uh, most people think Christians are fools and that, there was, that we're actually stupid. And the reality is, I think, if you expose them to the evidences we do have, um, it's not as stupid as they think. It's not as foolish as they think. But even Paul said that the gospel is foolishness to those in the world. And it's because they're blinded spiritually. So, uh, but I just want you to know that, you know, this week, um, I'm sort of changing my study habits because I'm just preaching this week and next week and we're starting just a brief series on 
uh, is Christmas believable? And so today I'm going to talk about some of the prophecies of Jesus. And so I've been reading, as a matter of fact, Fridays are my day off, but I couldn't stop reading about, I'm reading about the historical Jesus. And in secular culture, um, if you watch interviews on the History Channel or the Discovery Channel, or pretty much any channel on mainstream media, they'll interview so-called New Testament scholars that are not, they're not believers. As a matter of fact, in most cases, they're atheists or agnostics. And their presupposition is the same presupposition that we just saw a few paragraphs ago, where if your starting point is there's no number four, or your starting point is there's no God, then you'll never get the answer. Mm -hmm. Because if you eliminate the answer at the outset, you're in trouble. And that's where most people in the world find themselves. So you've got New Testament scholars uh, like Bart Ehrman, who are very influential. I mean, Bart Ehrman makes, makes at minimum $4 million a year on just his writings alone. And here's a guy that went to Moody Bible Institute and Wheaton College and makes a living um, debunking the Christian faith. Um, and, and it's just interesting to me, though, that these people are the ones that are, they're the ones that are interviewed on TV. They're never going to interview me. The only way they'll interview me or, or have anything to do with an evangelical is if, is if we fall sexually, yeah. <laughs> financially, or attack the, the, you know, the, the sacred cows of the day like homosexuality. Then we'll be in the news. But if it's about truth that conflicts with the accepted uh, views of culture, they don't want to have anything to do with us. And so I just want you to know that that's the reality. And, and I don't think that reality is going to change unless there's a serious revival that takes place uh, in, in America. Um, so even though we're the minority and we're getting, um, uh, again, I think the good thing is Christians are waking up. You really can't be lukewarm and make it in this world, I don't think. I think you have to be all in. And, uh, but I just want you to know that you do, you still have, even as the minority, we still have the advantage because we have the truth and God is on our side. So one final point they make in this chapter is they talk about theistic evolution. And again, depending on what kind of theistic evolutionist you are, um, you know, Francis Collins is probably the most famous theistic evolutionist. Um, he, uh, he professes faith in Christ, but um, there, I, I just I, I really I just want you to know I, I have a tough time with theistic evolution, and I, I don't I don't really see the point of it, um, and one of the main reasons I think is because of just how um, the idea of evolution the theory of evolution is that it involves a lot of death, a lot of death and a lot of suffering. And I just don't think that that's the way God works. I think that's the way Satan works. Um, and so I think the theistic evolution and naturalistic evolution and any kind of macroevolution, in my opinion, is satanically driven. I really believe that. And the reason is because Satan is the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus comes to bring abundant life. And from the outset, in Genesis 1, we see that God creates and he says, it's good. I do not see death after death after suffering after death after death after death for billions of years. I don't see in any way, shape, or form how that could possibly be good. Um, but I think it's the pressure, you know, what we read about a few chapters or a few uh, paragraphs ago was that uh, tenure's on the line, your job's on the line, peer pressure from your peers is on the line. It doesn't matter whether it's truth or not. It's just, I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose grants. I don't want to lose my position. I, I don't want to uh, step down from this high position I've been put in in culture, because scientists are way up here. I mean, scientists are the highest level the most respected level in culture, and yet it's ironic that there's no number four. <laughs> there is no God in science. And um, 
So I just want you to know that I think it's, it's, I think that the greatest lie in our culture, the, the most devastating believed lie is materialistic evolution. But close to that, which is amazing, is how theistic evolution has made inroads in the church and in Bible colleges and seminaries and universities. I would say it's the main held view today, um, in churches even. So we are a tremendous minority even in Christianity on our belief if you're a creationist. Okay, so, um, so let me just read what they have to say about theistic evolution. One final point, again we're on page 9, top of page 9. One final point that needs to be addressed here is the teaching of theistic evolution or the belief that God used evolution to create the world. Sadly, this idea has been widely adopted by many Christian colleges and churches today in the misguided belief that they are able to compromise scripture to accept evolution. Some Christian academics, in order to hide their belief in evolution and make it sound more acceptable to their constituency, have renamed this teaching progressive creationism. They are being not only, uh, again, that word progressive really <laughs> bugs me, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, they are being not only scientifically dishonest, but biblically dishonest as well. First of all, theistic evolution or progressive creationism is a nice idea if there was any evidence for evolution. The problem is that there is no evidence for evolution, theistically or naturalistically. Second, why would a perfect God use an imperfect means to create a perfect world? Evolution requires two things, chance and massive death and destruction through the survival of the fittest. The theory of theistic evolution teaches that millions of species died in order to create Adam and Eve. When evolution got to that point after billions of years, then God supposedly started the human race and gave man a soul. But Romans 5.12 teaches us there was no death prior to sin, and sin came through one man, Adam. Okay, let's, I just want you to look at that, Romans 5.12. Okay, Romans 5.12. And I'm actually going to read to uh, verse 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. So again, it says that sin came into the world through one man. Okay. And death through sin. So how did death come about? Through sin. Through what sin? The sin of one man. Okay, so that evolution as far as I'm clear, case closed. Okay, just case closed. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned, when? From Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And then he goes on to talk about Jesus, who's the new Adam. And so when you read theistic evolutionists, the most concerning thing to me is a guy like Dennis Lemero, who in the book Four Views of Adam, uh, on whether he was historical or not, Dennis Lemero just flat out believes that Adam evolved. And he's a part of Biologos, which is Francis Collins' organization. Um, even Timothy Keller is uh, writes for Biologos and buys into theistic evolution. Yeah. And it's just, it's really disheartening to me yeah. um, to see people, even Bruce Waltke, you know, Bruce Waltke is considered one of the top Old Testament scholars in the world. He's also a theistic evolutionist. He goes so far as in an interview to say that um, for Christians to not buy into evolution is to believe in myth. And here's a guy who taught it. Dallas Theological Seminary for many years. Um, it, it's just, I don't know, it's one of the saddest things to me is how many Christians have gone apostate or 
not, if they're not apostate, have gone progressive or uh, buy into things like same-sex marriage, uh, like theistic evolution, and, and just it's a compromise in a direction that there's no telling where they'll go after that. And I, I'm just here to tell you, if, if you ever see me contradicting anything in the Bible, um, warn me first, and if I don't repent, you have permission to stone me. Okay, you heard it right here. Because uh, again, I, I just think there's no hope for the world other than what the Bible teaches. And I'm a die hard believer in the authority, the inerrancy, the infallibility of scriptures. And too many pastors have gotten away from that. Um, they want to make peace with culture. And to make peace with culture is to make a pact with the devil. So um, I'm just putting it out there publicly <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, again, we, we have to stand firm in these things. And I think we have good evidence to stand firm in these things. Okay, so, um, so Romans 5.12, as we just saw, tells us there was no death prior to sin, and that sin came through one man, Adam. So how could you have massive death and destruction over millions of years to get Adam if there was no prior death to sin? So to be a theistic evolutionist, uh, you have to deny um, the inerrancy of scriptures. And you have to say that the Bible here is an error. Now that's a big mistake. Uh, I think that's the death nail for anybody. If, if you go against a clear teaching of Scripture on anything, that's why I stand so firmly on uh, male-only pastors and elders. Because to go against that is to deny, deny what the Scriptures clearly teach in both the Old and New Testament. And yet, most pastors barely even blink at doing that. And in Marin, we are in the minority on that for sure. I mean, most churches have women pastors. I, I think that is a clear violation of the clear teaching of Scripture. Okay? So, you know, it's, it's just one step in that direction, and it's not too far of a step to theistic evolution, progressive Christianity, no hell, you know, no judgment, and on and on. Universalism, um, and so forth. Okay, so um, let's keep moving here. So the main problem for theistic evolutionists seems to be the nature of God, the geology of the earth, the size of the cosmos, and the distance of stars. First of all, they try to help God out by making the days of creation in Genesis chapter 1 to be long periods of time involving billions of years. And this is because they have a very small concept of who God is. If you understand the nature of God, you realize that he did not even need six 24-hour uh, days for creation. If you understood the omnipotence of God, he could have done it in six seconds, or one second, or less than a second, okay? Second, theistic evolutionists hold to a uniformitarian view of geology, which is a foundation stone of evolution. This view, created by atheist Charles Lyell, in the 19th century states that the earth has changed slowly and gradually through the ages by means of processes that are still going on today. Those who hold to this view, including theistic evolutionists, deny the worldwide flood at the time of Noah, as recorded in Genesis chapter 7. They must reject the universal flood because a cataclysm of this magnitude would destroy their entire uniformitarian view of geology. This is why theistic <coughs> evolutionists in many Christian colleges and seminaries teach the idea of a local flood located just in the Middle East area. But this is not what the Bible teaches. Theistic evolutionists have brought into the false into the false idea or bought into the false idea of the geological column and the dating of the earth by it. The geological column was invented in the 19th century by Charles Lyell. He divided the earth into 12 so-called earth ages. These earth ages were based upon the philosophical assumption of evolution that many millions of years were required at each stage for things to have evolved. 
This is why you always see the supposed evolution of life laid out next to the supposed 12 Earth Ages. The dating of the Earth's strata is then based on what are called index fossils. These are fossils that Lyell said should be found in each of his 12 ages of the Earth. The fossils in each age were determined based upon Darwin's theory of evolution. In geology, you date the rocks by the ages of the fossils. In paleontology, you date the fossils by the age of the rocks. Let me show you the secret con game of evolution and how it works. Sadly, many Christians have naively fallen for it. By the way, um, Gunter Backley is considered one of the top ten paleontologists in the world. And um, he, he, he was uh, working for the, the largest natural museum in Berlin, Germany. And he wrote an article for a scientific journal uh, basically suggesting that evolution is in error in these dating methods. And he showed uh, from his study of paleontology, again as a leading paleontologist in the world, why he believes that uh, the evolutionary theory is faulty and that even paleontology points to intelligent design. And he's the first major paleontologist to do that. And within two weeks after his publishing that article, he was fired from the museum. He got hired by the Discovery Institute in Seattle. Um, but Gunter Beckley writes on this in that thousand page book that I've shown you many times that's edited by Wayne Grudem, J.P. Moreland, uh, and, and Stephen Meyer. Uh, there's a thousand page book that is a critique of theistic evolution and Gunter Beckley writes the critique from paleontology in there. It's pretty technical. Again, all the scientists that write in that, including James Tour that you saw on video a few weeks ago, their articles, the scientific articles are very technical. But you can still read them and get something out of it. But I just want you to know it's work. It's sort of like if you haven't exercised for a year and you want to run 12, 12 miles, that's sort of what it's like. It's like you're just heavy breathing and you're, you, know, you feel like you're going to pass out. Um, but I just want you to know that there are scientists out there that are willing to go against the flow. But the penalties are pretty harsh. And uh, it's just really unfortunate because, again, instead of education, we have indoctrination. And, but it's important that we understand that. You know, because one of the things that evolutionists, th this is just an aside, but I think it's important. Uh, when, I, when I talk to evolutionists, they always say, well, how come everybody they interview on TV buys into evolution? How come, how come all the, uh, the articles that are published in the journals I buy evolutionists? And I say, well, it's just like the 20,000 doctors that were canceled for going against the vaccine. Right. You know, the reality is we live in a world where truth doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's who's in power and follow the money. Okay, that's just the way it is. And if you don't get that, you're in trouble. You're, you're naive. You, you have to go above and beyond to investigate and evaluate for yourself where does the truth lie. And that does, like it or not, it takes work. You can't sit in a lazy boy and by osmosis through mainstream media get the truth. It's not going to happen. You have to work to discover the truth for yourself. And I think that goes for every single subject today. Okay. Um, so that's just my two cents on this reality here. Okay, so, um, so if you look at in, in the World Book Encyclopedia found in every school and library under the title Fossils, volume 7, page 422 of the 1988 edition, you will find this. Scientists determine when fossils were formed by finding out the age of rocks in which they lie. But if you turn to the title Paleontology, in volume 15, page 102 of the 1988 edition, you find this. Paleontology, the study of fossils, is important in the study of geology. The age of the rocks may be determined by the fossils in them. Okay, this is circular reasoning. 
And you know what? I doubt they've changed that since. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that uh, when I listen to and read, uh, especially those who are dealing with paleontology and fossils, this is exactly what I see. Okay. So they accuse Christians of circular reasoning all the time. But the reality is they use circular reasoning as well. Now I want you to know that circular reasoning is not, doesn't necessarily make it wrong or right. Okay? Yeah. It's, is, is the evidence, uh, does the evidence seem to lie in that direction? For instance, we can't, 100%, can we prove there's a God? I don't, I don't think we can. Okay? But is there good evidence for proofs for God's existence? I would say absolutely, okay? And there's much better evidence for the existence of God than, I think, the non-existence of God. And, and so, again, we don't have 100% certainty of almost anything in life. Um, but do we have good beyond a reasonable doubt evidence, just like you make a decision in a court of law. You don't ever have 100% certainty, typically, in a court case. But is, is it beyond reasonable doubt? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're after here when we're looking at evolution and we're looking at what the Bible says and we're comparing that. And again, we're saying that when all the evidence is in, we will find, I believe, that there will be no conflict between objective truth in relationship to science and what the Bible teaches as well. But if there is a, a, a bona fide conflict, like billions of years leading to Adam, and there's already been death, and that contradicts what the Bible says, then you have to say, that's wrong. I'm going with God's revelation, okay? Rather than, uh, at that point, I would say that's a false interpretation from science imposed on what the text of Scripture teaches. And I think that's incredibly dangerous in, in any subject. Okay, so um, the next paragraph there, by this means you can date anything any age you want. Strangely, this geological column used as the basis of dating the Earth in the theory of evolution has never been found anywhere in the world. It is a creation of Charles Lyell's imagination. In fact, he created it because he saw it as a way to destroy belief in God. His creation and the worldwide flood is recorded for us by God in the book of Genesis. But even if we did find evidence of the geological column, it would not be proof of evolution. Rather, it would show everything being buried by a worldwide flood in its logical, ecological niche. The last point that seems to confuse theistic evolution is the age of the cosmos, which they date based upon the distance of the stars and the time it takes for light to travel from the most distant stars. Based upon this naturalistic assumption from the Big Bang theory, they generally date the age of the universe at around 15 billion years. They claim that the farthest thing we can see is a quasar, which is 15 billion light years away. Therefore, they say light must have been traveling through space 15 billion years for us to now see it. First of all, it is important to understand that there is no way scientifically you can measure out 15 billion light years. This state is largely based upon the assumption of evolution and the time it will require for the galaxies, stars, and planets to have formed from a Big Bang in order for life to have begun evolving three and a half billion years ago. Even if we could take a measuring tape and measure out 15 billion light years, one light year is 6 trillion miles, or the distant light travels at 168,282 miles per second in one year, it would not bother us because God tells us the purpose of the stars in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Isaiah 40, 12, 22, and 26 says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Not only does Genesis 1-1 tell us that God created the heavens, but 
The above passages show that the heavens are intended to declare the glory of God. If the purpose of the stars is to let us know how great and mighty God is, then it is obvious that the God who created the stars would also have created the light simultaneously coming from the stars so that we could see them in order to glorify Him. A Christian astronomer said to Ron after one of his lectures on creation and a young age for the earth, I have a problem with your age. As an astronomer, I believe the universe is 15 billion years old based upon the speed of light and the distance of stars. Ron asked him a simple question. Whoever told you the distance equals time? What many theistic evolutionists fail to understand is that distance equals time only in a naturalistic worldview. God is eternal. God is not limited by time and space. Time and space are only a function of the natural created order. God is outside of time and space. He, in fact, is the creator of time and space. Thus, God did not need a Big Bang and billions of years of cosmic evolution. Rather, God create. Uh, thus, I'm sorry. Rather, God created the stars and starlight instantly at the moment of creation. As Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Okay, so before um, I open up for some questions, I, I wanted to point out some of the books here that um, that I recommend. And do I have? Let me see if I. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's on here. The Randy Elkhorn one. No, um, that, there there are two books. As a matter of fact, I have two books that I don't I didn't put it. And, and the reason is because I did this before I read them. But there's two books I've, I'm, one I'm in the process of reading and re one I've already read twice. Mm -hmm. But I want to just, I keep wanting to bring this up because they're just really good books if you wrestle with the dating thing, mm -hmm. the time thing. I think that's, that's something that a lot of people wrestle with. And I think as far as everything I've read so far, and I'll keep reading, but of everything I've read too far, this book by KP, uh, his name's Ken, I don't know what the P stands for, Coulson, C-O-U-L-O-S-O-N, and it's called Creation, I can never remember the name of the book. Uh, I'll look it up in a second. I think it's called Creation, Unf Creation Unfolding. I'll, I'll look on my phone right, in a second. So crea Creation Unfolding by K.P. Coulson. He's a young earth guy. Um, and he just wrote this book, and he's got a lot of videos. As a matter of fact, you can watch 27 interviews with him and Ken Ham on YouTube for free. And he pretty much discusses pretty much everything he wrote in this book. So if you don't want to read and you just want to watch something, um, you can watch K.P. Coulson with Ken Ham. That is the name of it. Is it? Creation Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, just a great book. As a matter of fact, I hope some of you read it because I just want to hear your thoughts on it. And it's, it's the book that I chose to read with my reading partner where we pick a book every month and discuss it. And um, So we already discussed it and he said it was a little over his head. Uh, but again, out of the stuff I've read so far, I tend to lean towards his view and I think it makes a lot of sense. But you sort of have to read it and wrestle yourself with it. Yeah, don't take my word for it, check it out. And then another guy that's really interesting is, um, is that in here? No, it's not in here either. Um, I want to make sure I spell it right. I think it's Gerald Schroeder. You have Ken Ham up there. Was there? Well, ag again, I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm specifically talking about people that are trying to reconcile the, the distance, the light years, the you know, what, what, sci what scientists are saying about billions of years. How do you reconcile that with a young Earth? And I think these guys, his book is specifically focused on that question. And that's why I think it's good, especially getting it from a young Earth guy. And I just think he does a brilliant job of explaining it. I, I, I tend to lean towards his theory as being true. Uh, and then there's Genesis and the Big Bang, and this is by Gerald, Gerald 
Uh, let me make it bigger because I get Schroeder, S-C-H. Uh, let me get the cover of the book here. S-C-H-R-O-E-D-E-R. -E -E and it's called um, Genesis and the Big Bang Theory. And the big, sorry for my writing, <laughs> big bang theory. What's interesting about this, and then this guy, Gerald Schroeder, you can listen to him on a show by Zola Levitt. He is a um, Jewish convert to Christianity. And he has a uh, show, and I think you can watch his interview with Gerald Schroeder on YouTube. Um, and even the, there, there's a smaller book that Zola Levitt and Gerald Schroeder did together, which is the interview that he had based with Gerald Schroeder. And Gerald Schroeder has a PhD from MIT. He's not, as far as I know, I do not think he's a Christian, um, but he's Jewish. And, um, and he was very, if you watch the interview or read the interview uh, that he has, uh, so this book is sort of his full treatment of the idea he holds to the billions of years and the six-day creation. I found his podcast is Zola Levitt Ministries newsletter podcast. Yeah. So if you, if you type in Zola Levitt and uh, Gerald Schroeder, you'll probably be able to find this, I'm sure, on, on YouTube. And, um, but again, if you want to go into this deeply and check it out, but what he holds to and Colson holds to is um, two different ways of believing in the billions of years and the six day, 24 hour creation. And they, they both attempt to reconcile those things. Uh, again, one's coming from a physics perspective. He, this guy's a, he has a PhD in physics from MIT. I, I think he's actually a professor at MIT, I'm pretty sure, or he was. Um, and then Colson teaches at uh, San Diego Christian College, which used to be Christian Heritage. So um, Tim LaHaye, who pastored uh, what used to be called Scott Memorial Church, was followed up by David Jeremiah. And David Jeremiah, uh, is involved with the school, with the Christian school, which used to be Christian Heritage, called San Diego Christian College, and Colson teaches there in the science department. Um, and so, but Colson's from Australia, and he's, he has his own YouTube channel, so if you type in him on YouTube, you could subscribe to his channel, and he discusses all kinds of science things. And what I like about him, more than anything, is he has an Australian accent. <laughs> I mean, he's just really great to listen to. He's just got a great accent. Um, but really neat guy. And so this was his first book, and I'm hoping he'll write more and more because I just really enjoyed it. I'll, I, again, I've read it twice already, and I think I'll read it again just because I'm trying to just get this stuff. Um, so anyway, th these are just some resources if you really want to check this out. I, I, this, uh, specifically, how do you reconcile these billions and millions with the six days? And, and again, I don't, again, science is not my forte. Um, I'm a, a total layperson when it comes to science. But I read probably more than most people do. And so I've read, I, I've read Dawkins, and I, I've read the, I've read the, the atheists, I've read Darwin's Origin of the Species, I've read the, the key source books by evolutionists, and every time I read them, it actually gives me joy that the, the, you know, the arguments are just so weak. It, it, just, it, just, it gives me joy and then it gives me sadness too that most people just buy into it and they don't read any alternatives. So I'm the type that I like to read the original sources from the opposing views, and then I like to read a lot of the views that oppose that, and I like to just sort of compare and contrast, go what are the pros and cons of the different views. Um, but again, I, I have to be honest with you, I haven't totally landed yet on this issue, but I, I definitely, I'm probably 98% <laughs> um, 
hold to a young earth. Um, I, I think we're, we've been around here about 10,000 years. And I think the, the case he makes is again that if you take, for instance, the miracles, like you take water into wine, a viticulturist, if he doesn't know anything that just happened, and he just examines the wine that Jesus just made, most likely he's going to be wrong in his dating. Why? Because Everything in the wine seems to suggest age, and it came from a certain region and a certain type of grape and, and what have you, unless it was just completely different than any kind of existing. But most likely, it was a type of wine where everybody said, wow, this is really good. As a matter of fact, they said, you know, this is amazing that he saved the good stuff for last. You know, usually you'd send the, save the, you know, serve the good stuff first and then serve the crummy stuff because people have already had so much wine it doesn't matter anymore you know uh, but it was the opposite it was like wow you know the good stuff comes out at the end and usually for any of you who, who drink wine or know anything about wine typically good wine um, Columbo you know if you ever watch Columbo there's a great great episode of Columbo that involves wine and he's trying to discuss he's trying to learn as much as he can about wine. So he goes to this guy who's French and he owns this wine shop and Columbo shows up and he says, tell me everything you know about wine in an hour. <laughs> and the guy looks at him like he's nuts. You know, it's like, are you kidding? It's taken me a whole lifetime to acquire the knowledge I have about wine. And he goes, how do you know if a wine's good or not? And the guy just says, the price. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, and again, typically the price goes up, usually on the basis of the age of the wine. Uh, and again, some wines, you know, it depends. I mean, it may not be as old, but it was a good year for wine. And, but typically, really good wines, wines that sell for millions of dollars at auctions or hundreds of thousands of dollars at auctions, tend to be old wines that you don't even drink. It's just more... Uh, like art, you know, you just, it, it, you buy it as an investment, but you're not going to drink a million dollar of wine, you know, a uh, million dollar bottle of wine. Anyway, um, but, but if somebody were to examine that wine that Jesus turned into wine, and here's what Colson gets into, is there's examples of miracles in the Bible where it's almost like you have to view it almost like time-lapse photography, where the process of how that wine would have come about without Jesus' intervention would most likely be, um, there would be some type of scientific methodology of observation to determine where that wine came from, how old it was, what kind of wine it was, what kind of grapes and everything. And that if a scientist evaluated it, the reality is he would be somewhat off because that miracle was instantaneous. However, that miracle also went through the whole process that it would take naturally to get there. Okay? So like, for instance, uh, a lot of you know that I, I got to witness somebody's arm growing back in India in 1999. I saw a guy who had a stub here, and uh, we prayed for him, and before I knew it, this arm was just was matching to his other arm. And I've thought about that, and I've thought, um, okay, so what I just saw, uh, bottom line was a supernatural thing. There's no way you could explain it naturalistically. But if a scientist was there and was to evaluate his arm and take a DNA sample from this arm and a DNA sample from this arm and a blood sample from this arm and a blood sample from this arm, what would he find? And in one sense, he would probably find the same age, he would probably find the same DNA and everything. But how quickly did that happen? Well, I, I don't remember how quickly it happened, but it was fast. Okay? Now, it took me, I know, years to grow both arms, you know, to the length. I don't know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't have a degree in anatomy, 
But I know that my arms weren't fully grown at eight, uh, grown at eight or nine or twelve. You know, probably sometime around sixteen, seventeen. I don't know. I don't. I don't really know. But I know they're fully grown. I don't think they're going to get any longer. Okay. And if you were, if somebody were to do a study on my body, they would discover that I'm as old as I am, give or take a few years, right? But again, for a guy like that, whose arm has been a stub, I don't know how long he had a stub. I don't know if he was born that way. I don't know if it happened in an accident. I don't know. I, just, I, I didn't talk to him about it. It was a pretty quick thing that I discovered. But here's what I know. I have absolutely no problem with anything to do with ages because I've seen a, something that happened in a process that was much quicker than it naturally happens. Mm 